testing, testing. I think that's a little better. And if you mute, mute the black one, we should be good. Welcome. Sorry, praise. The praise team got out here a little late today. We were having a Bible discussion in the side room about part of my sermon, which I figured I wasn't going to really present today. We had a discussion about it. So um, that's where I was. That's what happened. Um, today, this, this past week has been a hectic week for me. I had a lot going on. Um, you know, last Sabbath, when Joe was preaching, our can you turn me down just a little bit more? Um, w- when we were, we were doing the sermon last week, our computer up in the, our presentation computer died. So we scrambled to get that one running. So I spent time looking for um, getting a different computer and I did some testing and then just, I ended up working on the church computer and got it up and running and fixed. So we, were, so we didn't have to get one. So that the praise of the Lord for that. Um, and yeah, there's just all kinds of things. Got the mother room, mother's room up and running also. So if you go down to the mother's room, you'll have TV, you'll have sound, you can hear what's going on up here. So um, if you're, you know, so you don't have to miss anything. You can, you can go down and enjoy the mother's room. It looks like it's pretty comfortable. So um, So I, I chose this title, which is Choose, because everything we have in our life is a choice. We have to choose between what we do every time, all the time. And sometimes you don't know what the outcome of your choice is going to be. And um, so as we go in and we look at some of this stuff, and like I said, um, I, am, I do think I am skipping over the first part of my sermon our discussion in the side room. And we're going to move on to um, the second two-thirds of my sermon. (laughs) So, not sure. We may be out of here early today. We'll see. It all depends on what is inspired to come out of my head. So, I would like to... Our our, uh, memory verse today, which was Joshua 24, 15, was at the end of Joshua's life. And, you know, one of the things which you may not realize, but in Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 11, the same words which were used by um, Joshua in the preceding text basically was this. It says that, um, don't forget who brought you out of Egypt or beyond the river. Um, and God gave them all the land, the cities, with no effort on their part. That was, that was in Deuteronomy. Say, that God told them that you are going to go across the Jordan into Canaan, and you are not going to have to battle because I am battling for you. So God told them that when they crossed the Jordan, that the land would be theirs. And basically, the only thing you would have to do is move in. So everything was prepared for them. The fields were prepared for them. The houses were prepared for them. The cities were prepared for them. And everything was theirs. God gave them. And God moved in, in front, before them. And they could just take over the land. And, but in the, in the condition that was in Deuteronomy was that they, this would all happen if they chose the God in the Bible, Jehovah, to be their leader and their guide. And when Joshua's coming to the end of his life, he says, I want to remind you of what God told you to do. God told you to choose him, and he will bless you in this land. And he made the speech, and this was, this was the, I would have to say, maybe the pinnacle point of the end of his speech was the fact that I am choosing, I, I'm obeying God, I am choosing God, 
But you guys have a choice. It says, it says in, in, in that text that you have a choice. You have the choice of choosing God. Or you have the choice of choosing the gods of the people in that land. And everyone was all... I guess it was like evangelistic series. They're all fired up. And they says, we're going to do it. You know, sure. That's it. We're going to do it. And they moved into the land. And they took over. Um, after Jericho fell, literally fell, um, it seemed like they had no big issues in moving into the land of Canaan. And you look at it and he says, oh, that's great. It's great. Everything is hunky-dory. But you, you know that just a couple pages, in, just flip the page over and you come to Judges. And in, in the very beginning of Judges, it says that after just one generation was eliminated from the Israeli group who took over Canaan, that the next generation rebuked God. Just one generation. And they chose for not God. They chose for the idols of the Amalekites and all the other ones. And from there, um, you know, the life for the Israelites wasn't so easy. And, you know, God chooses to protect those who choose him. And one of the things which was in a sermon that I heard this week, well, I put sermons on and listen to them as I'm trying to study and create my sermons. It gets me in my right mind. And one of the things they said is that, that caught my mind is that we have power over God. And everyone says, we don't. God is all powerful. That's true. God is all powerful. But we have one powerful thing that we can do, and that is not choose God. If you, not, if you don't choose God, then, just like the Israelites, God can't help you. You are stuck. You are in an area where you have to repent, you have to come back, you have to go to God before and ask him to come and help you again. And time and time again, that's, you know, that for some people they never do that. And they stay away from God. And God has a hard time helping them. And if you looked at the, if you go through Judges, and you look at Judges, not just Judges, you go through Judges, you have the King, you have First Kings, Second Kings, you have all those. And there was, when I was studying with the juniors many years ago, and we had to study judges and kings and um, Samuel and all those other things, there was one theme that always came across, and that was that the Israelites, before they had kings, did evil in the sight of the Lord. When they had kings, the kings always did evil in the sight of the Lord. So they chose wrong throughout the whole history of Israel, it seemed like, and they had these periods of times where they were able to get together and choose to follow God. David was a strong, strong person in, getting, in uniting the Israelites into um, following God. But there are other strong peoples in the Bibles that had to, to make choices also. And you know, I can go through the abbreviated version of Daniel because we just went through that one. I can go to the very last three-second segment of the thing and says, you know, Daniel chose to follow God. Because Daniel was able, chose to follow God when he was put into a situation, God was able to save him. Sometimes, and... Um, he was able to come back out of the lion's den and not be lion food, come out from the lion's den and continue on 
with his love, respect, and his constant choice of following God. There was also some other people, such as Joseph. He was a person that was treated not so fairly by his own family. His own family sold him into slavery, and he chose, no matter what, he was also going to do what Daniel did and chose to follow God. So um, he went, and he went into finally was sold into Egypt and was working in Egypt. And I think one of the greatest compliments that was ever given to a person that served God in such dire circumstances was because of his choices and follow God, God chose to bless him in all that he did. God blessed all the people Joseph worked for. So it, the blessings wasn't just for Joseph, but because he followed God. Joseph was able to bless other people. And um, because of his choice of choosing God all the time, life didn't go easy for him because he was thrown in prison for choosing not to commit adultery. <laughs> and um, there he was in prison, and you would say he had a tough life, but it wasn't long before Joseph, who was blessed by God, was able to bless other people and became in charge of the prison and from there, he made acquaintances, and um, he was able to go and save the Israelites from the was able to save the Israelites from the, you know passing away due to the yeah yeah thank you <laughs> and from the famines that were around. And, you know, so God does have plans. You choose God, you follow God, you don't know what your life is going to be like, but God has plans for you. And you do it like Joseph, um, you know, saved, saved the you know, Israelites from the famine. Daniel, who didn't become lion, lion food, in the next few chapters wrote about the image from of the golden head silver brass iron and you know which gave us the history of the world basically of what's going on and and letting us know that God knew what was happening way before time and you know this also brings us to his three friends who also um, right from the start chose to be with Daniel in his not eating food presented to idols and all that other stuff in the kings, not partaking of the wine and all that other stuff, the rich food that the king had out on his table. And the Lord blessed Daniel and his friends for doing that also. You don't hear much about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego except for the one story where they would not bow down to the idol which the king had made of all gold to represent him defying God, saying that he was going to be in charge forever. Um, but God knows better than that. And from that, the punishment was, if you don't bow, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they wouldn't bow, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And with that, they became, they became a witness to the king because... They said, wow, there's four people in the fire. One must be the son of God. And they were pulled out. And they witnessed to not only to the king, but to, they showed all the people that had committed or bowed down to the idol that standing for God is better than not standing for God. And then there's Esther. We know the story of Esther also, where um, the Israelites were, had, a, had a death sentence on their head, and they had a certain day in which they were, they were all to be gathered and killed. And 
the king, not knowing that Esther was a, an Israelite, um, I guess they didn't take that into consideration when they, they had the beauty pageant back then on where you're from. But Esther had to go in and she had to choose also to go and say, look, these are my people, these are God's people, I have to stand up and I'm gonna stand up for these people and whatever happens, happens. That's, that's the choice that we have to do. And she did go in and she did see the king. The king did grant her um, the right to speak in front of him and she made the request about stopping this. And the king says, I can't stop it, but I'll tell you what, I'll put out another decree saying that the Israelites can protect themselves with not just with sticks and stones, but with swords and spears or whatever they, armament they had at the time, which virtually put the stop to um, the attack on the Israels on that specific day, which they were all supposed to be eliminated. And then there are other examples in, in the Old Testament also, and that is Elijah saying, hey, follow Baal or follow God, what are we going to do? And God puts his proof down with fire on this altar and burns it up. That was an impressive show of power by God at the time, and the Israelites were inspired again to follow God. And, but unfortunately, every time you see they have this big spiritual experience, it's not long before they're right back into where they were before, um, worshiping idols um, and, you know, just choosing not to follow God. And, and it's, wonder what the world would be like today if they did, chose to follow God all the time, all the, t all the way. But it did not come to pass. So one of the biggest examples we have is, of course, Jesus. He had choices which he had to make also. And I, I, I like this because it, it goes through the whole book of, you know, you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you go through and see Jesus' choices. You know, if you are to follow someone, emulate someone, then read through, three, read through um, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels and see how Jesus handled himself, and then try to incorporate that into your life. Because Jesus always chose God also. Um, I know there's some people say that, well, Jesus was God, Jesus is God. But when he was here, he was man with part God. And I don't want to get in a debate on all of that. that. But he was here, and at the age of 12, he knew exactly what he was to do and where he was going to, to be. It says that on, when he was 12, on the custom of Mary and Joseph, they would go to Jerusalem for Passover. And so during this time, Jesus went to the Passover and at the age of 12, and Passover was now over and they left. But they didn't keep track of where Jesus was. And after, after a while, they realized that Jesus wasn't there. Um, they contacted the relatives they were traveling with, and Jesus wasn't there. So they went back and searched Jerusalem for three days looking for Jesus. And they found him in the temple talking with the, the Pharisees and scribes. And they were the Pharisees and scribes were amazed on everything that Jesus knew at the time for just being 12, which means he must have really studied the Torah and, and the books of Moses and all the other written, um, all the written documentation and stuff that they had about, you know, what was in their past. To come up with the, come up with the fact that he knew that he was 
not going to be a normal person on this earth. That he had, he had a sp special duty which he was supposed to do. And when they found him, you know, just like every mom says, you know, where, what are you doing? Why did you do this? You know, you, you were driving us crazy. We we're nervous. We we're afraid for you. And his response was, why were you looking for me? Don't you know I'm supposed to be about my father's? I'm supposed to be, I had to be in my father's house or I had to be with my father in the temple. So you, you go at the age of, of 12 and then you jump ahead to just after his baptism. After Jesus' baptism, he went to the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And after that, if you go into... Um, you know, Mark 4, 1, Mark 1, 9. Um, he was in the desert. Of course, when you're in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, you get really hungry, really thirsty. And so the first attempt that Satan had to really um, attack him was at this time, knowing that being baptized and, and baptized and seeing that the Holy Spirit came down on him and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, that Satan had a short time in which to get Jesus to relent his throne in heaven. So his first attempt was, you know, you're hungry. You know, you are, you are basically God. You know God. Just ask him and he will change these stones to bread. And, and you know, and he, he throws it in there with a little bit of, uh, you know, says, if you are the son of God, turn the stones to bread. And Jesus answered, man does not live. <laughs> man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from, from the mouth of God. So that's Attempt number one. And I like the fact that the Bible uses this term. It says, the devil failed, so he transported Jesus. You know, I like that word, transported. We don't... A lot of, lot of things that go on when, when we use the word transport. All kinds of visions come to... Different ideas to different people, but I like that. Whether it was just... Um, in his mind that he was able to put into Jesus' head, you know, the fact that he was now standing on top of the temple at, in Jerusalem at the high point. And Jesus, uh, again, goes and says, hey, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down and God will save you. You know, that... You have to process that, right? Because if he did that, was he disobeying God and therefore would God really save him or not save him? But it didn't happen, so we don't have to worry about it. Um, Jesus says, away, uh, Jesus said, answered, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And I think that's also a, something important that we have also. I, I know... Um, Sometimes I'd like to be like Gideon and say, hey, I want, my, I want the fleece to be wet. Okay, it's wet. Ah, that's just too easy. Let everything around it be wet and it be dry. Okay, so, yeah, okay, now it must be the Lord. That would be great to have answers like that from the Lord. But again, it, it says, you know, even Jesus told us, you know, don't put... You know, do not put the Lord your God to the test. He is willing and able to protect you and take care of you. But, you know, I think the, the reason why is if you give God the choices, I want to do this or I want to do that, that, um, that is putting God to the test because that, not be, that may not be what God wants you to do that you should, okay, this is going on in my life, Lord, where are you going to lead me? 
Don't say, I want to do this or I want to do that. That's putting God to the test. But say, I choose to follow you and I know that you have what is good for me in your heart. Therefore, guide me in the way I'm supposed to go. I believe that that is the, that is the way in which God wants us to react towards him. When we choose God, we also choose his ability to lead you. And then Satan takes him to the top of a mountain and says, look at everything here. I will give you all this if you bow down and worship me. Now that's a whole new sermon in itself. Just those words from Satan right there. Is, if you, I will give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. How many people here in this world have bowed down to get everything that you see here? You know what I'm saying? Um, but Jesus, at this point, says, I, I feel like he had enough of what was going on. And he just says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So when we go through and we look at all of this, you know, the devil did have one more chance, I feel. Um, you, he goes through the Garden of Gethsemane uh, and all the pressure is put onto him. And, you know, he knows that he knows that he has a question if he can do, go through with it or not. And he says, if it is all possible, take this away from me. And sometimes when I was reading through this, this whole scene about the crucifixion, it, it came to me that, you know, um, the devil did kind of have one more jab at him right there at the very end. It wasn't Satan himself coming, but he just, when Jesus uttered some words, um, you know, one of the soldiers says, hey, it looks like he's calling Elijah to come down and, and help him. And the other guard just says, well, let's wait and see if Elijah will come down and help him. You know, basically saying that, you know, if, if he really wanted to, he didn't have to go through this. He could choose not to do this. And it was just words from the thing that put in Jesus' head that, you know what, should I go through and do, should I finish this the way which I'm supposed to finish it, or should I just stop it here? But the, the, very, the very next line was basically, and he gave up the, and he died. So, at this point in time, I, some, you kind of have to think if Satan thought that he had, you know, this was the end of, you know, and that he was now going to have rule over the earth because, you know, hey, he died. But when... It, it came to the next few things that happened. Earthquake, we, we just went through that. Darkness covered the earth. And the fact that the, whole, the holy place where the priests are supposed to go and the most holy place where God is, um, they were no longer separated. The presence of God left Israel, basically. The, the veil was torn down and there was no more God in the most holy place because it was all one big room. What was it that would happen if you went into the most holy place? You would die. But that was not it anymore because no more sacrifices had to be done because the Lamb of God um, had already chosen to die for our sins and that we would have to, we had a new way in which we would repent 
and be forgiven for sins because the Lamb of God already died. And, you know, when, then I want to jump to the last days. And, you know, in the last days, we're going through a lot right now. And I came across, I, you go through and read Revelations, and Revelation 12 reads, Then the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to war, went to make war against those who obey God's commandments and hold the testimony of Jesus. And if we are now living in the end times, we still have to make a choice. Are we going to follow God like the old faithful did in the Bible? Or are we going to um, choose the gods of the Ammonites and the Canaanites and the others. And when you go through and you look at verses 14 in Joshua, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers. Worship beyond worshipped beyond the river in Egypt. Sorry, the pause there kind of messed it up. And serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. And I believe that we're going to have to continually choose to serve the Lord like everything, like everyone in the Bible did, daily. That we have to choose to follow the Lord. That when things come upon us in our everyday life, we don't have to think about what we should do because like Joseph, like Daniel, like those great people in the Bible, they didn't have to think. They did. God, they, they knew God was with them. We know God is with us. Choose God. So I guess it's time now for... The closing, yeah, I would have been another few minutes if I would have taken on the first part. But um, So following God, it, come on up for closing song. Our closing song is six, 620 on the Jordan Stormy Banks. And while they're coming up here, I just say, please, you know, hopefully with our church, it's not going to be like... Um, the, the Israelites after Joshua with just one generation after us that um, they will choose not to follow God. <laughs>